Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Bill Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit ibethel.org. Grab your Bibles, if you would, open to two portions of Scripture, Matthew chapter 6 and Romans chapter 5. We're going to start with the Matthew 6 passage, and then we'll go to uh, Romans chapter 5. Many of you are familiar with Old Testament stories pertaining to the nation of Israel, some of their heroes, their kings, their prophets. And one of the most common stories has to do with Israel and uh, their journey through the wilderness, eventually settling in the promised land, ending up establishing their own nation. And all of it provides great prophetic pictures of what God is doing now, but specifically, I want to talk to you about the role of kings in Israel's history. We know that we know that Israel had started with King Saul. They actually insisted of God that God would give them a king like other nations. And tragically, Israel didn't have anyone ready to be king, anyone groomed by God for the position. My personal conviction is Saul was the best that Israel had to offer. And as they insisted on having a king, God released an anointing, a favor, a grace upon Saul to be a good king. In his beginning years, he was a very good king. Actually, he rose with great zeal, uh, great excellence. He had humility in his own uh, humility. He, he, he wasn't a self-promoter. Um, he used his position well uh, to serve as a king. But through time, he, uh, he lost that that grace. He gave it up, actually, through personal sin. He began to manipulate his position as king. He began to uh, war against the prophet Samuel and some of the purposes that the Lord had for him. Uh, Long story short, he ended in a real shipwreck, uh, a real uh, uh, guy who abandoned his, his role. And the Lord raised up David, of course, to take his place. And while Saul was still king, David was anointed to be the next king but there would be a period of time between the time he was first anointed and him actually becoming king. Saul became very jealous of David because David had such favor. He knew what the presence was like. He knew what the anointing, he knew what grace was like. He, the Bible says he went from following the sheep, twice it says, he went from following the sheep to becoming king over Israel, which is interesting because shepherds don't typically follow sheep but he went from following the sheep to being promoted to being a king of Israel. And I think the emphasis is on the fact that to be a good king, you have to pay attention to the needs of the people around you. And that was, that was the point of the Lord. So the Lord began to groom him, just even as a shepherd boy, to become the king that he actually desired. Saul ended in great disaster. Uh, interestingly, the women started writing songs and uh, in the top 40 uh, song list uh, in Jerusalem of that day uh, was the song that talked about Saul killing his thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands. And that sent Saul on an extremely insecure tirade in which he spent about 10 years, maybe as many as 13 years, actually trying to kill David. Saul inherited the position ungroomed. David was very groomed. 10 to 13 years of somebody trying to kill you helps to prepare you to be a unique kind of leader. <clears throat> so the next time you ask the Lord to promote you, just remember there are processes involved that the Lord tends to use. Many have come out of this story of Israel insisting on having a king. They've come out with a conclusion that God never intended for Israel to have kings, that God always intended for a him, he himself to be their king, and for them to never have an earthly king. It's just not true. When the Lord spoke to uh, Abraham, the father of faith, the one uh, through whom would come Isaac, the, the father of Israel, the word of the Lord to Abraham was, and from your descendants I will raise up kings. So before Israel was even a nation, the Lord released the word that it was his desire to raise up kings. The problem is that all the definitions that we have in this world of royalty, of what kings look like, is they're almost all of them are very, very self-serving. 
Uh, they're self-promoting. They have everything in the world to do with protecting their longevity. They're, you know, they'll, they'll put somebody else at risk to taste the food, so if the food's poisoned, they die so that they live. And everything is built around sustaining the health, the life of this particular king. And even the good kings, as, as good as they were, David was, was uh, outstanding. Uh, he had a, a rough patch, but he was a great king. Hezekiah was a great king until his final a final season. And so Israel has some great kings. But, uh, but Jesus actually came to bring a fresh revelation of what royalty was like from his perspective because we had such a perverted perspective of what kings look like. Why? He did that because his intention for every believer was royalty. His design for every believer was to be kings in the earth. Even now it sends shudders down people's spine to call every believer a king because it seems so rather self-serving, self-promoting. And yet when you see Jesus was the perfect example of a true king when he took a towel and wiped, washed his disciples' feet, that was a servant's act. And yet he was illustrating, modeling for us what a real king looked like from God's perspective. Everything he did, he did to illustrate what a real king was. It's, it, it's out of this theme that I, I came to you with this phrase a number of times now, that we are to rule with the heart of a servant and serve with the heart of a king. God is redefining this issue, and the reason is he has an intention for your life, an intention for my life, that we would take our right place as royalty, that uses unlimited resources of heaven for the well-being of the people around us. See, a king doesn't listen to a problem in his kingdom and wonder who's going to fix it. A king faces a problem knowing that he has the authority and the resources to solve anything that comes his way. It's for that reason when somebody comes to you and they say, oh, I just injured my back. Kings know we don't pass the problem on. Jesus illustrated what it was to be a king by addressing every problem that was brought before him. Because we are actually drawing on the unlimited resources of heaven. I personally think, I know that uh, oftentimes people ask me and, and others of us to pray a Father's blessing, which is a, a beautiful thing. Um, and usually the things that are prayed for are things like identity, uh, which we'll talk about briefly today, identity, uh, purpose, destiny. Those are all things that are wrapped up in a healthy home. Those things are cultivated and developed. But there's a fourth thing that I've been adding for quite a few years to this mix, and it's the awareness of unlimited resources. I think if I can just give a, a parental uh, bit of advice, I think we're supposed to train a generation with an awareness that we, as we serve Christ, we have a, actually have access to unlimited resources for anything and everything he has called us to do. And it doesn't matter whether it's an anointing for a miracle, if it's needing a word of wisdom for a problem that's come up, or uh, uh, finances for a, a call that he's put on our life. The point is, is that kings don't think with the same, same limitations that everybody else in the kingdom lives with. God has called us to be kings and priests, and we'll try, I'll try to give some definition for that. So let's start in Matthew 6 with the uh, first passage. Very common verse, in fact, I, we, I studied it with you maybe a month or two months ago, and, uh, but let's read it again. Verse 33, um, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I, I've been trying hard to recognize what God says is a priority. So when he says there's faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love, then you pay attention to his, his way of thinking. When he says seek first the kingdom of God, then we have to adjust all of our value system to accommodate that value. It's what helps everything else in life to work. 
So here we have this statement, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, as I covered with you a month or so ago. Um, when he says, and his righteousness, he's not adding something. He's not saying, seek the kingdom, plus, while you're doing it, seek his righteousness, as though it were separate. It is actually one of the, th it's a third in Paul's definition of what the kingdom of God is. In Romans 14, verse 17, he says, Paul says, he says, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. So when Jesus says, seek first the kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy, and then he says, and his righteousness, all he's doing is adding special emphasis. Why? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> because the measure to which the righteousness of God is seen in our behavior, it is to that measure that we reign in life. It is in the measure of his righteousness being demonstrated in our behavior, not just positional, but in our behavior, to the measure his righteousness is seen in our behavior, to that measure we reign in life. I, I did a, a series a couple of years ago on wisdom, the beauty of wisdom, and it's just one of my one of my most favorite things I've ever done here in 20 some years that I've been here. And because I, I actually put it off for like 10 years until the Lord gave me a liberty to, to, to do it. And this, this thing of wisdom, I've got to run through this quickly, but the word, the word proverb, here, here's our deal. The word proverb for the title of the book of Proverbs means a riddle or a saying, uh, it actually comes from a word that means to reign or to rule. And so wisdom by nature equips us to reign in life. That's the, that's the essence of wisdom. Divine reasoning enables people to reign in life. Now understand, we're looking at the divine definition of reigning, of ruling and being kings. It's not ruling over people. It's actually being equipped and enabled to empower and to serve people well. It's a grace that enables us to meet the need more than sufficiently, adequately. And so this concept of wisdom in the scripture is, is to me, I love the book of Proverbs. I just, I love it so much. It's like, you know, we all love the uh, statements, the, the phrases that seem to take these huge thoughts and just kind of reduce it down to one statement. And uh, many of us gravitate to those kinds of things. I love that. Well, Proverbs is like every verse is one of those. You know, you take every two verses and you've got an entire sermon right there. It's, it'd take you a week just to unpack that thing. And that's Proverbs is filled with that. Why? Because it is the divine reasoning that enables people to reign in life. Why is that necessary? If you're not reigning in life, Nations and kings will come to your light. I would like to suggest that that picture of prominence is reigning in life. And that's what the nations and kings are drawn to. Look at the passage with me out of Romans um, chapter 5. It's verse 17 and 18 of the two that we want. For if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, he's talking about Adam's sin in the garden. For if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Look at the last half of the verse. Those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, 
resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification in life. Do you see what it's saying? It's saying, all right, death came into the world because Adam and Eve sinned. And that curse of death was upon all of their descendants, which is all of humanity. Jesus came not as the second Adam, but as the last Adam to make one payment of his own life to atone for the sin of all humanity so that in the same way death was released into uh, the human condition, now life, blessing, reigning is released into the human condition for all who respond to Jesus by faith. What was the target? Reigning in life. The Lord has actually desired from the beginning that people would, it's, it's not a posture, it's not a, it's not a place of identity. It's not like I'm reigning in life so now I'm thinking better of myself. That's, that's not it. Your, our identity is entirely in the one who called us to himself for salvation. None of us, our identity cannot be real, built around our title, around our function, around our gift around where we are the most powerful. Those things do not define you. They are functions. They are privileged functions. But they are not the thing that God uses to release identity. That is in the voice of the one who called you to himself. Reigning in life starts with how we manage our own internal world. It actually starts. It's not... It's not that we become successful in business and we become you know, influential in the political scene and all, all those other th kinds of things. Those are fine, but the, the most important world to reign in is this internal world. It's how we think about ourselves. I can't afford to have a thought in my head about me that he doesn't have in his, his, his head about me. And it's that, it's that ambition to take on the mind of Christ re uh, regarding life itself the way he views money, the way he views relationships, the way he views family, the way he views anointing. All these things are valuable to me. I, people will say, well, we have a right to our own opinion. Well, go ahead if you want. I, I really can't afford to have my own opinion. I've had my own opinion. It just didn't work. I, I just would rather have his. And if he gives me the liberty to think for myself, then I'll do my best. But the, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, be careful what you ask for. So here's this, this issue of ruling over this internal world. There are four things that cripple people. It's guilt, shame, regret, and bitterness. There's more we could add to the list, but you, 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 get, the, you get the point. Guilt, shame, regret, bitterness. I think it, probably it's common knowledge that our own bodies respond to what's going on inside of us. Uh, people will often become ill. Uh, certain conditions uh, start to manifest in people's bodies when they've carried bitterness for a long time. Uh, hatred, uh, fear, those kinds of things just actually affect us emotionally, mentally, eventually affects our health. That's why the command is given in Scripture that we would prosper, be in good health, even as our souls prosper, that our, our internal world would actually influence our physical health. And that's the design of the Lord. He made us that way. What I've noticed is uh, through the years, I've, I've prayed for a lot of people, and uh, I, I don't ever go on a witch hunt when I'm praying for somebody. I just try to get them well and hoping that that kindness of the Lord will, if, if there are issues they need to deal with it, they'll do with it. But occasionally there's a real roadblock. And I'll, so I'll ask them a question. I'll say, is there anyone you need? I remember sitting, somebody sitting right over here on the front row. A conference was getting ready to start. And I walked by and said, hey, how you doing? I said, oh, I'm in great pain. I said, man, what's wrong? So I started praying for and prayed and prayed and prayed. Nothing happened. And I just, I, I didn't ask because I discerned anything. I just thought, well, let's just go through the list. I said, do you need to forgive anyone? She goes, oh, yeah. I thought, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> <laughs> Most people are running through the years, you know, you're smart enough to try to hide it, but not her, boy. She just, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, 
okay, uh, how about we take care of that? She said, okay. And so she told me who, and I just led her in a prayer of, uh, of repentance and, you know, praying for them and stuff. It's just, it was hilarious. She got healed in moments after she forgave people. But, you know, it just, certain things happen to us physically with resentment, hatred, that sort of stuff. What I've noticed though through the years is that regret has a similar effect on the human body as does resentment, bitterness. And the reason is they are both tied to the past. Now our identity has to be built out of how God sees reality. How he sees it is right. Let God be found true and every man a liar, the scripture says. That's one reason why I really don't want an opinion different from his. <laughs> so here, here's this responsibility to view who we are through his eyes. It's interesting, in, in uh, Romans chapter 8, it's, which is just such a hallmark chapter, uh, there's, there's this place in there where he says, uh, um, he says, all things work together for good, which is a, one of the great, great statements uh, in the faith. Another one that f- immediately follows that says, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And then he goes through this list, you know, the angels and all this stuff. None of that can separate you from the love of Christ. And in the list, he says, things present and things to come. And then in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 3 actually, uh, 2 and 3 are actually two of my favorite chapters of anything Paul ever wrote. And they just, they really helped me, helped me in, in, in my life. <clears throat> and at the end of chapter three, imagine yourself sitting in a lawyer's office and the lawyer is about to read off the last will and testament. This is what you inherit. You know, you get the house, you get the car. And so that's what he's doing. He's reading off the inheritance. And so we're all sitting in there and he calls out your name and, and he's reading, oh, this is interesting. Um, you inherit the world. Like the whole thing? Yeah, yeah, it's all all yours. Apparently, we're responsible for taking care of the planet. Churches. Then he goes on, he says, oh, here's interesting. This, I don't know what you're going to do with this. Uh, Life is yours. And uh, and not only that, uh, death now belongs to you. I didn't know what I was gonna do with the world. I certainly don't know what to do with life and death, but anyway, that's what I'm inheriting. And then he goes on and he says, oh, things present and things to come. I'm very fascinated by things to come. How can you own in the present what is not yet? It hurts my head to think about, so like much of the Bible, I just put aside and go, amen. <laughs> amen, amen, whatever you say, amen. So in both Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 3, the writer says, you own things present, you own things to come, and something was obviously omitted, and that is the past. You don't have legal access to the past because it's been purchased. And any time we revisit the events of yesterday, Apart from the blood of Jesus, we are visiting something that is no longer true. We open ourselves to a spirit of deception because we visit something that is no longer in the condition we remember it. The beginning place of the shift in identity comes right there. You have the present, you have the future but you don't have the past, that's been purchased and it is covered by the blood of Jesus so that it no longer has a voice to haunt you, to cripple you. It no longer has the authority to do so, why? It was bought, it was bought. You would never sell a car to someone and then find a spare key in your house for that car, go to their driveway and take it out for a spin. Why? At least I hope you wouldn't. I have met a few people that would, but I don't think they're in the room. The point is, it's not yours. And your past 
is not yours. It's not yours. It's not yours. So, identity in Christ begins at that point, at that place. Learning to reign in life is to see our life today through that lens, that everything up until this point is covered by the blood of Jesus. It will be used not against me. It now is in his position to be used on my behalf. It's one of the strangest things in the Bible, but God's view of justice, I believe justice is very, very important and we need it right now in so many areas of our, our life as a city, as a nation. But for every one of us in this room, once you get forgiven, all the hostilities aimed at justice to destroy are aimed at the powers of darkness. They're not aimed at you. They're aimed at what influenced you. That was much better news than your response was. I, it's too late, but that was really good news. So here we have this issue of our past, regret, bitterness, all those things. Whenever, remember the Lord's Prayer, he says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Notice what he did. He linked together our need of ongoing forgiveness with our responsibility to be an ongoing forgiver. Notice, I heard somewhere recently, notice that when he taught us to pray in that Lord's Prayer, he said, forgive us our debts, our trespasses, as we forgive those who sin against us, that he linked our need of ongoing forgiveness with our responsibility to be an ongoing forgiver. He put the two in the same breath. Why? Because you, you can't ever separate the two. Well, Bill, you don't know what they've done to me. No, I, I, there are people in this room that have experienced things, horrific things I can't possibly imagine, but here's the deal. My sin against a perfect God is much greater than anybody's sin against another imperfect person. He forgave me. It created the standard that must be maintained to illustrate, yes, I reign in life. When you reign in life, money doesn't rule over you. You rule over money. This doesn't control me. Once it controls me, it's become the master that I serve. I control it. A couple places in Scripture, there was conflict over offerings. And it wasn't over how much somebody gave. It was the fact that they deceived people into giving Ananias and Sapphira. The emphasis of the lesson was, while it was in your control, you had the responsibility and privilege to do with it as you pleased. That was actually the teaching of the chapter. And they used it to obtain favor from people for giving something they actually never gave. It was, it was a lie. The, the, point, the point I'm trying to make is, these dollars, this one has been in circulation since 2013. It's been a lot of people's hands. It's now in mine. These are soldiers in an army. I'm the general. And I am able to use these, whether it's giving to a missionary, buying a meal for the homeless, or buying my wife a purse, which I am the king of purse buyers. I want you to know <laughs> I don't, I don't try shoes. I have tried for years. I will sit down with her, open a catalog. I say, honey, show me what shoe here you would buy for yourself. She goes, oh yeah, that one right there. It's never the one I would pick. Never, <laughs> never. I won't go near shoes. <clears throat> I don't have the grace. There's no anointing on my life for shoes. Purses. <laughs> Guys, you want help? I do purses. I'm very serious. I do purses. And if I give, huh? I, yeah, they're expensive purses. Of course they are. How, how do you treat a queen?
It's amazing what you'll say under the anointing. It just flows. There's more coming to mind, but wisdom is starting to kick in. So I, I just leave it right there. I reign over this. I can't afford to have my soul reigned over by this. It's the quickest way to poverty of soul to serve money. I just bought her two nice new purses for her birthday. <laughs> the ball is still flying. <laughs> it is so far over the fence, it's still going. It was a <laughs> Kingdom finances depend on a number of things, but I'll give you four. And these things that enable us to reign well. Generosity, contentment, excellence in purchase. You want to demonstrate who you're serving by what you buy. Don't buy cheap. You'll have to buy it again. I'm not saying, I'm not saying be, be careless. I'm just saying be wise because you're modeling something. Let even what you own. Jesus owned a seamless robe. Let what you own illustrate who you are. Wise investments. Let your money make money. Generosity, contentment. By the way, contentment in the kingdom is not the absence of desire for more. It is the unwillingness to allow lack to define your joy or your identity. Contentment in the kingdom is not the absence of desire for more. Contentment is the unwillingness to now allow need or present conditions to define your identity or to rob you of your joy. Reigning in life. Every area, relationships, we are not controlled and manipulated by the latest opinion of that family member. You know the one. <laughs> or two. Honestly, you're not governed by the opinions of people because you're reigning in life. And what happens, the arising and shining is literally us coming into places where, yes, there's success there, but it's success for the benefit of other people. That's the whole point. is that you have a neighbor come to you and say, you know, your kids treat you different than my children treat me. What did you do? They're not asking to know Jesus. They just want to know about the kingdom you live in. They don't know how to ask it, but that's what they're asking. And you have the opportunity to let them taste and see for themselves that the Lord is good. Reigning in life. Everybody in this room is designed to reign in life. God gave you the ability to create wealth. It's a God-given gift to all of his people. It proves he can make a covenant with people. That's what it says in Deuteronomy 8. He's made you to be the head, not the tail. To be the lender, not the borrower. If none of those are true now, they are in your position. They are in your inheritance. They are in, in the last will and testament that was announced over your life. So what do we do? We readjust our thinking to appropriate what God has actually made available for us because you were designed to reign. Amen. It's good stuff. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast is now being translated in several languages. Visit podcasts.ibethel.org.
Welcome to the Bethel Church Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message by Pastor Bill Johnson. For more information about this podcast and other resources, visit Bethel.com. We're in, uh, I mean, you'd, you'd have to be, I don't know, brain dead or spent the last eight months on another planet to not realize that we are, we're in the most unique, interesting times of our lifetime for sure. Uh, there have been, uh, as we look at history, there have been crazy times throughout history where the church uh, faced incredible uh, difficulties, challenges, where mankind faced horrible, horrible circumstances. And uh, so we're not the first generation. I, I don't want to throw a pity party. We actually have it quite good by comparison to other times and seasons. But we do have our, our hands full, so to speak, as we uh, face the dilemmas that are before us. And here's what I want to talk to you about today. <clears throat> when the Lord allows a challenge to come our way, the challenge is to reveal need and invite us into breakthrough. Whenever the Lord brings a challenge, maybe it's a financial thing, could be a health issue like this pandemic, it could be any number of things. The Lord is exposing a need in me. If I, if I turn to fear, he's not shaming me. If I turn to insecurity or panic or whatever, my, he's not shaming me. He's just bringing to the surface where I have built wrong security. Insecurity is wrong security exposed. And he brings it to the surface, not to shame me, but to bring it out in the open so I can deal with it and move into divine solution, move into God's answer. So we have, uh, we have some th situations around us right now as a nation, really the nations of the world. I've I, uh, been uh, talking and texting and, and what all with people from all over the world in just recent days and, and uh, the challenges of our, of our friends all over the world is really high. But I, I want to come to you um, encouraged today. Encouraged because there's not one problem that exists on the planet that Jesus doesn't have an answer for right now in his mind. He's already got it th thought through, well prepared. The answers, the solution is available. <clears throat> I remind you that Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is the absolute fulfillment of every single cry of the human heart. Every longing that we would have in life is fully satisfied. It's temporarily satisfied by situations in this life, but is in complete fulfillment in this realm called the kingdom of God. So when Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he is announcing, he is challenging a generation of people, change your perspective on reality, otherwise you will always live under the influence of the inferior. I have brought my world with me, the dominion of the almighty God that brings things into order, that manifests the abundance of life, the peace of God, the, the uh, salvation of the Lord, spirit, soul, and body. This that he brings to us is available as we turn from the inferior, embrace this thing called the kingdom of God. Today, I want to, uh, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of here as a messenger to remind. I want to remind you of things we've studied, things we've prayed, things we've done in years past. And so I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Acts. The book of, book of Acts, and we're going to go to chapter 4. And I'm going to read to you uh, today portions of a story that has um, dramatically affected my life through the years. I'll I'll never forget the first time I saw and recognized <clears throat> this particular passage and, um, and realized what the Lord was calling us to. So, in chapter 3, we have Peter and John come up to a gate. There's a lame man there. Peter makes this statement. He says, silver and gold have I none. The lame man was begging for alms. He says, I don't have any money, but I'm going to give you what I have. And then he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Man, I love that story so much. I love it because Peter says, I don't have this, but I do have this. 
I've got a name. I've got a name to which every power must bow. I've got a name. It's been entrusted to me. Every power must bend its knee in the confession that Jesus is Lord. I've got this name. And so he declares it over this guy. Many of you are familiar with the story. Read it on your own. <clears throat> Acts chapter 3. He's walking, leaping, praising God. He just received an absolute transformation in his own personal life. When we come to chapter 4, we have in verse um, 13, we have Peter and John are now brought before the religious leaders and uh, they, are, um, they are chastised, they are rebuked, they are punished, they are imprisoned because of this name Jesus that they preach. It actually says in verse 12, there's no other name under heaven by which someone must be saved. We must be saved, and there is no other way. It's critical that we hold that intention because we're not working with multiple options. We're working with one King, one Lord, the eternal Son of God, Jesus the Christ. But in verse 13, I just love the verse, it says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized they had been with Jesus. Spending time with Jesus more than compensates for any weakness or deficiency you have. <laughs> Having been with Jesus, you know, there's gotta be stuff going on in our life where people can look at what you're facing and look at your response and say, they don't have the training for that. They must have been with Jesus. There's something about walking with the person that more than compensates for every deficiency and weakness. And we are invited into that right now. We're invited into that because Jesus in this season is giving the church an opportunity to face the obstacle of opposition, face the obstacles of pandemics, of uh, issues, health issues, etc. Face them in the power of the gospel. I'm going, to, I'm going to exhort you today that we must return to our roots in any way we have uh, abandoned or laid aside as not being a priority. So just follow with me here. It says uh, they recognize that they had been with Jesus. All right. So in verse 18, it says, they called them, these are the leaders, they called them and they commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Yeah, that's hilarious. And they commanded, they didn't suggest, they commanded, these people of authority commanded, you are to no longer speak in this name. Now, this is interesting because Jesus, the food multiplier, didn't offend anybody. But when you start demonstrating power and you start making the pronouncement that you must forsake all to follow me, then suddenly that name is offensive, especially to people who think there's multiple ways to God. And they rebuke and they tell them to not preach in the name. Verse 19, Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Oh, goodness, I just think that's funny. I want to see the video clip of their faces. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. And then here's this verse. We cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. <clears throat> Look at this verse again. Uh, some translation, I forget which one, says we cannot help but speak that which we have seen and heard. Can you help it? If you can, you don't see it. Is it an option? Can you turn it on? Can you turn it off? Then maybe we need another glimpse. Something's got to happen. The greatest reality in the universe is the presence of the resurrected Christ. That reality. 
and to fill my heart and mind with all the inferior things and not with the power of his resurrection gives me an option. I can turn the message on and I can turn the message off. It becomes optional. If it's optional, maybe I don't see it. It's not a shame thing, it's an invitation. He says, we cannot help but speak what we've seen and heard. We are living without options. My invitation to you today is it's time to sign up again for the lifestyle that has no options. No options. We were designed by the Lord for this hour. We're designed for this. We've been prepared throughout our entire lifetime. I don't care if you have a lifetime of shipwrecks, of a failing God, doesn't matter what it is, everything up to this point is a tool used by God to make you and me a righteous influence in the earth. It must be said by the people of God, we cannot help but speak. We cannot help it. We cannot help but speak of the things we've seen and heard. It is no longer an option. We are so immersed in what God has said and what he has done that it is no longer an option. I pray that God removes the options for us in this <clears throat> word today. All right, we're just warming up, getting ready for the part that I love so much that I want to read. So they were <clears throat> released in verse 23. They were let go. They went to, to their friends. They reported all that the chief priests, the elders had said to them. And when they heard that, verse 24, they raised their voice to God with one accord. That phrase is repeated often in, in uh, the book of Acts especially. Their voices raised up in one accord. In other words, they were in absolute unity, saying the same things, praying the same things, declaring, confessing the same things. It's vital, not that we say the th same things, it's vital that we hear what he's saying. And by hearing that, we all say the same things. In other words, it's not a humanistic unity we're looking for. It is the mind of Christ declared on the lips of the people of God. They came into that place of unity. They raised their voice with one accord and they said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and the earth and the sea, all that is in it. And then he goes on to, to quote this scripture about the nations being enraged. Sounds very familiar. Now I want you to come down to Peter's prayer. Peter prays this prayer. Now this has been, this is where I've been aiming uh, for this morning. <clears throat> Peter prays this prayer that is uh, one of the most courageous prayers prayed in the Bible. And I'm going to repeat a story that I've told you many times through the years. But let me read these verses first. Verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your bondserv your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Look at it again. Lord, take note of the threats. New American Standard says, and grant that your bond servants could speak your word with all boldness while you extend your hand to heal. Signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. <clears throat> I love this story a lot. Why? Earlier in verse 13, they recognized the incredible boldness that was on Peter and John. <clears throat> and yet when they were opposed and they were threatened and they were told to shut down what they were doing, they prayed for greater boldness. They didn't pray for fancier words. They didn't pray for any of the stuff that we might have done. Sometimes we become fearful of certain movements or groups of people, and we compromise our testimony to become more appealing. And what is actually needed is a greater boldness that the breath of God would breathe on and release his hand to do the impossible because he's responding to a courageous people. If ever we've needed to be courageous as a people, not offensive, not obnoxious, none of that junk. That's all counterfeit stuff. Absolute boldness for who Jesus is and for who he, what he has said, what he has taught, what he has promised us. So here's this story 
at a time where they could have prayed, God, give us favor in the political world. Give us favor with religious leaders. Instead, they said, God, turn up the heat. Our boldness got us into trouble. We were imprisoned. We were threatened because of our boldness, because of the miracle. So give us more of what caused us that problem. It's a very rare way to pray. We generally try to appease those who, um, I believe we're supposed to be wise. I believe we're supposed to speak the, the mind of the Lord. I believe we're supposed to love and to serve. No brainer, that's who we are. But there are times where we compromise our own faith in order to take a safe route that does not cause conflict. Here it is. God, give us all boldness. You gave us some. We've seen your name glorified as a result of the boldness, but we're asking right now, that boldness that caused us such conflict, increase it, increase it. Years ago, I was told a story <clears throat> about a test pilot in the UK. He was taking a new plane up. I don't remember all the details, the circumstances, but he was taking a new plane up to, uh, uh, to see how it handled and all that. And it didn't have a lot of the, <clears throat> the shrouding and stuff inside the cockpit. And uh, when he got up to a certain elevation as he's flying, he happened to notice that there was actually a rat on the plane chewing on a fuel line. And as the story goes, this pilot feared he did not have time to land the plane. And so he took it higher. He took it higher because he had oxygen. The rat did not. He took it up to an elevation where the rat could not survive. Oftentimes the church notices a rat on board and in panic tries to land the plane sparing the rat. When in reality, we need this prayer. God, we got in trouble because of boldness. This time, give us all boldness. Increase, increase that which we need so desperately right now. We don't need a compromised version of the gospel of power. We don't need one that fits well into everybody's opinions. What we need is the gospel of Jesus Christ to be on full display. That's what we need right now. So do what you need to do in us so that we take the moment that you've given us, we embrace it fully and realize this problem is an invitation from God. It's an invitation by God to become who we're supposed to be, declaring what we're supposed to declare, practicing what we're supposed to practice. Here it is. They prayed that prayer, verse 31. The place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude, verse 32, of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. They had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Here's the deal. Acts chapter one says, you will receive power that you may be witnesses. Let's clarify something here. You don't need power to tell somebody you're born again. It helps, but you don't need it. You don't need power to give a sandwich to a hungry person. Now those things are expected. Those are things we must do. But power isn't needed for those actions. But power is needed if you're called upon to demonstrate the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
power. The lame man walks, he leaps, he prays God. What happened? The resurrection of Jesus was just put on display. Through our own cowardice at times, through our own weakness of faith, through all kinds of things, we allow a world to live around us that is grasping at straws, looking for answers, looking for solutions, when the entire time they've never seen the blatant evidence that Jesus is raised from the dead. We have nothing without the resurrection, nothing. So this story that begins in Acts chapter one, Power is needed to be witnesses. By the time you get to verse 22, they are looking for a replacement for Judas who betrayed the Lord. And it says, um, beginning from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, one must become a witness of his resurrection. This whole thing of being a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ certainly includes sharing our story We see Paul doing that. He would return to his own story on the Damascus Road and his conversion experience. It's a beautiful thing for us to share, but we must understand we have been called upon to illustrate, prove, demonstrate Jesus is raised from the dead. When the Lord, I had a situation a number of years ago. I I was in uh, Dallas, Texas. I was doing a conference there with a dear friend and um, I, I just remember two nights. I don't remember how long I was there, but I remember two nights. <clears throat> I was speaking at this particular conference and after the time in the word, we'd have time where we're praying for the sick, where we're ministering to people. And oftentimes we'll get down front and we'll have a line of people and we just work and pray with people. Somehow I got um, off to the side and in two nights I spent hours, hours praying over five people, hours. They all had MS and every one of them left in the same condition that they came in with. Oh man, it's painful because you feel these people are coming to you, in this case to me for prayer, wanting to meet Jesus. Because see, this resurrected one never turned anyone down. This resurrected one accomplished everything necessary for a person to be healed. And those people came, whatever distance they came, they heard I was going to be there, one of those speakers. They lined up and I spent hours praying. And two nights for five, not one was healed. That's the reality. And when I pray, I come to the Lord, I say, God, they came to me wanting to meet you. And all they met was me. And neither of us are impressed. You've got to do whatever you need to do in me so that the person that exhibits any measure of faith could come and could see the miracle touch of Jesus. I hear people will often make comments about somebody not being healed. And <clears throat> often people will say, you believe that if they're not healed, it's because of their faith their weakness of faith, and actually I don't. I don't believe that at all. The Bible says it's the prayer of faith that heals the sick, and if I'm the one doing the prayer, the praying, then I'm supposed to be the one with the faith. It's not a time for shame. It's not a time for introspection. It's a time to seek God. It's time for someone to be able to look at me and realize he's deficient in every area, but I can tell he's been with Jesus because he doesn't lack where he needs to have presence where he needs to have power, where there needs to be the demonstration of the resurrection of Jesus, he does not lack. I'll bet he has spent time with Jesus. See, Jesus would address 
weakness of faith. We know that he did that. He would, uh, <clears throat> to a man with a tormented son, he, he told him, if, if you can believe, all things are possible for those who believe. And the dad is just desperate. He says, I believe, but I also unbelieve too. I'm, I've got unbelief too. Help me in my unbelief. And <clears throat> it's, a, it's a verse that many of us have quoted in our moments of despair because we can identify with it so, so incredibly well. I believe, but help me in my unbelief. <clears throat> Every time Jesus addressed small faith, no faith, weak faith, Every time, he still provided the miracle. Every time. Not one time did he point to weakness of faith and withhold the miracle. Never. Instead, what he did is he exposed the weakness of their confidence in God, and he gave them a miracle to give them access to the greater faith he was talking to them about. At one point, Jesus said, you won't believe unless you see. Many people have read that and have thought, in fact, I, I grew up years reading that thinking he was criticizing them. He was exposing that they had to see to believe. What did he do in that moment? He provided a miracle. Why? Because he knew if they could see it, they could believe. <clears throat> Not displaying the resurrection of Jesus through miracles, through signs, through wonders, is to withhold from people the opportunity to believe. The opportunity. I remember one <clears throat> Sunday morning, quite a few years ago, I was walking through this before, quite a bit before the service was to start. And I remember right back over here, close to the back row, there was three or four rows in the back, there was a a family was there, and there was a man who, who um, you could tell he was homeless by <clears throat> his clothing, his smell, everything about him. Just let you know. And this family had found him and brought him to church, and so people were starting to come in. And I went back just to, just to introduce myself to him. And after I got there, I was talking with him and, and uh, just... Um, you know, just welcoming him and just telling him how happy we were that he was there. <clears throat> I noticed he had a, a cast, a, a brace on his arm. <clears throat> and I said, um, I said, hey, what happened? And he said, I fell off a bridge. He says, I, I shattered my, my arm. And he was in a lot of pain. It had been done. I didn't ask him when, but <clears throat> you could tell that it had been very, very recent. And he was in just Tremendous pain. He pain. He just kind of babied that thing as he as he held that there. And so I just began to ask him questions. I said, "He said, yeah. I said, I fell fell 18 feet off a bridge. I shattered my my arm, my wrist. And I said, uh, Would you mind if I prayed for that? And he looked at me like, you know, that's a novel thing. He didn't come thinking, expecting that. And the <clears throat> he looked down at the family that brought him and. They gave him kind of a thumbs up, you know. And so we just prayed a very, very simple prayer. <clears throat> when I was through, when I was through, he begins to move his arm. And I wish I had a video of his countenance because everything that was wrong was now right. <clears throat> All the pain that was there is now gone. All the movement that he could not have without excruciating pain, really compromising this injury. He could do everything. He was so astonished. He looked at the people that brought him. They are so thrilled. I'm besides myself in joy. It's, it's, you know, it's one of the great stories where, where God showed up and did something. When that happens, he gets all the glory. When it doesn't happen, he doesn't get the blame. He doesn't get the blame, and neither does the person that I pray for. But in this case, they were healed. I went on and celebrated with him and went on, met other people, and finally the service started. <clears throat> At the end of the message, I wanted people to surrender to Jesus. And so as we do, we like to always give occasion for people to commit their lives to Christ. Who do you think was the first person that day to surrender their life to Jesus? Of course, it was course. So the scripture says, it's his kindness that leads to repentance. To not be filled with the spirit of God 
to not be able to display the resurrection power of Jesus and confront those things that are impossible is to withhold from people a taste of the kindness of God. A taste, a taste of the goodness, a taste that actually gives them the courage to forsake this inferior life and to follow after this one, the only one who is worthy to direct and to lead my life, the resurrected Christ. Here it is. Here it is. It's the witness he's alive. It's done in many ways, but never is it to be without the miracle. <clears throat> we live with a, a tension, a tension of, we've had so many uh, cases of, of COVID-19 in our city, in our own church. We've been cra- praying like crazy. We're uh, um, just really looking for greater and greater breakthrough. We have many, many stories and testimonies gobs and gobs of wonderful stories of great miracles. But, uh, but what people seem to remember in this season right now is oftentimes what didn't happen. And I want to look to you, Bethel family, all of our guests that are watching, we're just, we're thrilled you take the time just to, just to watch this message with us. But Bethel family, I want to talk to you face to face for a moment. This is a moment where we do not become cowardly. We do not become apologetic. We do not create biblical excuses for the absence of what Jesus accomplished. This is where it's time to spend time with Jesus. It's time to do something in some way in seeking his face, crying out to him with his own word. This is what he declared. He declared that these signs would follow those who believe. He declared greater works than these would he do. He declared by his stripes, he made a payment in full for the miracle that we need. Why does it happen? By the grace of God. Why doesn't it happen? I'm clueless. And that's when I get back before the Lord. I don't create a religious excuse. I don't create a religious excuse. I don't deflect the blame, the accusation, the pointing of the finger. Exactly. They say, you believe in miracles. Why do you wear glasses? I said, because I can see better with them. <laughs> I better not go there because there's more, but uh, we'll just leave that, leave that where it is. We are a people that have the privileged responsibility to come before the Lord and to say, Father, touch me again. This time, let me see so clearly that I can say, I can't help but talk about what I've seen and what I've heard. It's not just the message. I have seen the message in action. And I can't be silent. I cannot be silent. This is not the time for silence. It's not the time for arrogance. It's not the time for self-promotion, all the other junk that is the counterfeit of real boldness. But it is the time. For Bethel, this is your call. This is my call. This is who we are. I'm not saying no one else is. I'm just saying, listen, this is it. We all signed up for this. This is the moment we get before the Lord. I, I, the other day, I, t- I took f- five different prayer walks. You know, on our, We have a little piece of land and just walking and praying, constantly walking and praying, getting up in the morning, getting my communion supplies, going outside and standing before the Lord. Father, <clears throat> You said by the stripes of Jesus we were healed. And here's this bread, this broken body that testifies of the absolute surrender of Jesus for our behalf. I hold this before you. Jesus became broken that we could be whole. He became empty that we could be full. He was rejected so we could be accepted. He was despised so we could be celebrated. He bore affliction so that we could be healed. Father, I hold this testimony, this witness of the resurrected Christ before you. And I say, Father God, heal our city. Heal our city. Do what is impossible for mankind, impossible for any movement. Only you, Father, can display your your heart in this way. We pray bring healing. Bring it economically. Bring it 
bring it relationally in families that have had such conflict come to the surface through this season. Marriages that are just really shattered because of this season. The fear, the anxiety, the businesses that have been wiped out and destroyed. God, we look to you. You are the one that suffered in our place so that we could stand in your place of triumph and victory. God, I'm asking that you do that. And day after day, that's what I do, and I encourage you, come before the Lord and pray. Pray for our church family, those who can't, we can't get together yet. Soon I pray, soon I pray. But we just stand before the Lord. God, bring healing all throughout this church body all throughout this church body. And it's not just about Bethel. It's not Bethel reputation. It's not, it's not a Bethel doctrine. It's the Bible. Yeah. It's the Bible. The Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. The Bible says, go into all the world, preach the gospel, teach them what I taught you, which in part was the demonstration of miracles. This is the mandate on our life. There are no excuses and there are no worthwhile alternatives. This is who we are. Yeah. Bethel, stand up and take hold of this thing. Even if you have to do so with fear and trembling, just be honest. Be like the guy in, in Mark 9 that just says, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. I'm struggling. That's fine. It's just come to him. That's all you got to do. I love the fact, no matter what shape I'm in, I can be a mess. I can be angry. I can be bitter. I can be distant, aloof. doesn't matter. As long as I come to him, I have the opportunity to not leave the same not leave the same, to lay it all down before him and have him make that great exchange. And I want to encourage you, Bethel family, we need to pray. Father God, heal our city. Yep. Heal our city. I know you've prayed it. I know you have. <clears throat> but I'm going to ask you today to do it with boldness. Stand. Proclaim, declare this that has been set up to bring destruction to families in our city. We say no to you. No to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. We pray right now the resurrected presence and power of Jesus would be seen, realized, discovered by every single family in our region, every household. My goodness, it says of Asia, every person in all of Asia, every household had heard the gospel in the book of Acts. After this great revival in Acts 19, every single household had heard the gospel. I want that right now in my, in my part of the world, where I live, where you live. We want every single person to taste of the kindness, the goodness, the wonder, the beauty of King Jesus. He said, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste is experience. See is perception. I want people to experience his kindness so that they have a new way to see what our Father is like. It may be that you've watched this entire talk time and, and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You, you would be one to say, I'm, I'm one of those that, that I don't have. I don't know what it is to be forgiven of sin. I don't know what it is to have a new nature. I don't know what it is to be a part of the family of God. I'm not talking about church membership, any of that stuff. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what's at stake. And you were born for such a time as this. But there's no amount of human strength or talent that can get done what needs to be done today. It's the yielded, surrendered life. It's the person like you watching right now that just says, Jesus, I give you my entire life, every mess I've ever created, everything I've ever been successful in, I give it all to you. And I ask you, please forgive me. Forgive me of all my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to be able to illustrate and demonstrate your kindness to the world around me. I pray this in Jesus' name. If you've done that, I want to encourage you. Uh, you're watching on YouTube or Bethel TV, just let this pastors online, let them know 
and they'll talk with you personally and pray with you. There are some of you that are watching that just need a miracle on your body. We just declare that healing word. This pandemic is inferior to the name Jesus. It is inferior to the name Jesus. I declare the name Jesus through your household where there's been a horrible uh, infection or somebody that has, I don't know if it's a growth or an abnormality in this part of the, the abdominal area. Uh, the Lord is healing you. Uh, there is somebody who have, you have great pain in your hands. And the verse that comes to mind uh, today <clears throat> is, uh, is to bring before the Lord clean hands and a pure heart. And when I was thinking about that, clean hands, I felt like he spoke to me out of Isaiah 58. And he says, stop pointing the finger. Your hands will be clean when you no longer accuse, when you no longer point at this person, criticize that one. I declare that healing word for you today in the name of the Lord Jesus, that God is restoring households. <clears throat> there are marriages. There's somebody who has a 14-year-old daughter who has, you've been estranged with her. There's been some major conflict. She's a, a blonde-haired little girl that just a beautiful young lady, but there's been great, great conflict. It's like, it's like the spirit of deception has got into that relationship and there's been a torment involved and we just break that assignment today in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want you to know something. We could, I could stand here announcing things that God is doing for hours and never touch everything. I want you to know that we serve a wonderful, wonderful Father who has you in mind. He loves you beyond description and he cares. You come to him with your condition, your need, and say, I give it to you. Please heal my body. Restore my finances. In fact, I pray for resurrection power in businesses in the next six months that we would see in our region of the world. And all those watching, a resurrection power of businesses in Jesus' name. I bless you. I wish I could see you and hug you, but at least I get a chance to talk to you. I just want you to know I love you so much. I, I'm so thankful, so thankful that we get to be carriers of this gospel of the kingdom. Thanks for listening to the Sermon of the Week. This weekly podcast can be heard in multiple languages on our Bethel TV website. If you'd like to partner with us in discipling nations and fueling personal revival, you have the opportunity to give at Bethel.tv slash podcast slash donate.